can all see it, I guess. Right, urban density is uh, uh, for MVRDV like um, uh, it's, well, it's our raison d'etre perhaps if you want, but maybe I can uh, briefly introduce MVRDV. Of course, maybe some, most of you know it. Oh, it won't move. Sorry. Nope. Let's see what it's working now. That's better. Right, we started our career with this, uh, which is called the Villa VPRO. It's a broadcasting center and it re redefined the way that uh, people work in, in, in large scale offices. We, uh, we then moved in 2000 uh, to um, this building, which is the Netherlands Pavilion at, uh, at, uh, in Hannover at the World Expo. And it was showing uh, how to make artificial nature in buildings. Very important for us as a, um, uh, in our philosophy. And in 2014, uh, another uh, highlight perhaps, we built Markt Hall, which was uh, a mix of uh, market hall and housing. And in a way, it also turned into the um, living room of Rotterdam. Um, in terms of philosophy, we really believe that the uh, urban sprawl is causing a lot of trouble, even though, as you can see, it's very comfortable to live there. Um, you always need a car uh, to buy even the, 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 you know, the most basic things. And hence, it is really bad for the, uh, for the environment. There's so many things why this is wrong. Um, and uh, you could really talk a lot about it. But at the other hand, uh, if, you, uh, if you stack up the city, if you densify it too much, perhaps you get something like Hong Kong, which is uh, also really a very stressful uh, situation. So ideally, at MVRDV, we're trying to combine these two uh, uh, conditions. And then we get these kinds of things. So basically, you have dream houses uh, with a lot of greenery, the suburban lifestyle, but it's stacked on top of each other. And this might be uh, located in an inner city where you can basically take the elevator down to the, um, to the opera. So uh, uh, adding to this is that human behavior actually transforms the planet. And we know all this. We know the warning by the Club of Rome. We know that the construction industry is good for a third of global emissions. And we also know that our children these days actually remind us that we're doing wrong. So there is a generation that wants to preserve the planet, which is absolutely fine. In order to do this, we need to kind of uh, transform uh, construction and we need to do this well. We need to do it sexy and we should not do it like here in Bochum, where they actually just made a, a, a lots of additions to an ugly building. Uh, what, uh, or here, uh, you know, all these buildings with small windows that, uh, that uh, create basically dark interiors. Architecture should also be loved and should be wonderful in order to be sustainable because sustainability is also the love for a, a building and, and to not ever remove it again. So here uh, we're trying in 2000 already to make a sustainable iconic building. You see the uh, windmills on the roof that want to scream out, uh, do something. Uh, however, you can also do this much more discreet, for example, here at the library in, uh, near Rotterdam. We wanted to show the books because this is the place in the Netherlands with the lowest readership in terms of percentage. And uh, what we needed here was an advertisement for the book, but it's also one of the best performing uh, buildings in terms of sustainability. So you can combine the two, you can have good architecture and you can hide the sustainable uh, um, features as much as you want. And the next step is entire cities that are uh, highly sustainable or that we do something to the enormous building stock that we have everywhere. This is a, a warehouse in Sweden, which we will double with the wooden construction. And then in the end, it will uh, also be a very a good building uh, in circular construction, but also uh, all kinds of uh, technological advances to make it good. Um, we're also trying to put the, um, uh, the 17 sustainability goals of the United Nations into our projects which is not just about technology, but also about philosophy and social issues and nature. The main uh, um, yeah, element perhaps in many cities to actually get uh, urban density is the skyscraper. And also here we see a real need to change this uh, typology. Of course, the skyscraper is a European, is not so much a European, but more like an, an Asian and American typology. And what we want to do, of course, I already said it, we want to put the qualities of the European city into the skyscraper. Can we create European skyscrapers? 
Currently, European skyscrapers perhaps are more a copy of American skyscrapers. Here you see an image of all the uh, skyscrapers of the Netherlands together. Then uh, on the next image, we have a comparison between the Asian skyscraper and the Dutch skyscraper. And what you can learn here is that uh, they, they are not that diff uh, different, but uh, the sky is a bit lower in the Netherlands actually than in Asia. Uh, but you see we, what we call a skyscraper is not, uh, is not actually a big deal. Uh, but uh, in terms of um, uh, structure, they're almost all the same. We built one in Lego here. It was not a very difficult, as you can see. And if you have this skyscraper and you change only one uh, block, uh, you have already a much better place. At this moment, you can only go up and down and look out. You might never meet your, uh, your neighbors. However, if you change this one Lego stone, suddenly you have an address halfway through. You can go out, you can, you can have more uh, views, and you can actually step uh, uh, out and you can invite your neighbors for a barbecue and this is the beginning of a vertical village that's basically what we want to do we change more parameters uh, in a computer program and then suddenly you end up with a, a skyscraper that has these kind of qualities and it's much wilder you see here for example it's maybe a modern version of an italian mountain village and you can imagine that people will actually know each other that they have also uh, public uh, spaces in between so uh, we were able to build these uh, after we done a research at Delft University of Technology at the Y factory. And you see, we built 16 of these towers because Lego was very nice. They sent us 1 million Lego stones. And so we were able to make them. Here you see them. Uh, they have now moved to the Centre Pompidou and we uh, call this research the porous city. So to find new topologies of skyscrapers. Of course, 16 wasn't enough, so we started to uh, play a little bit more with this computer scripting and we got this field of 350 European skyscrapers. We had to call Lego to provide us with more stones. They were extremely generous and sent us another million stones. And so we built them with the students and then we discussed their qualities. There's also a publication actually. So it's almost like a manual how to make this uh, skyscraper with village uh, appeal. And when we were then asked to actually build one ourselves in Amsterdam, and uh, there was a very tight budget, even though it was one of the most expensive buildings of the country, we decided to uh, solve all the problems uh, in a design which was then optimized with scripting. So here you see 80 different varieties for one tower. The red ones are bad, the green ones are good. You see there is one very green one, provides an ideal mix of outdoor space, views, shadow, acoustics, but also uh, more technical issues like the amount of facade panels or window types. So these are very much uh, geared towards making this kind of building feasible. And it's now under construction. It's about to top out. And you see the uh, construction uh, money is very low compared to, for example, what you would have to pay in Germany. So this, uh, this is the valley in Amsterdam and it has a, a lot of human scale it brings into the skyscraper. It will, be, uh, it will be ready next year. Around the central tower, there is a public footpath. You can walk up, you can walk around it, and on the other side, you can walk down. There will be restaurants and bars, uh, and of course, lots of outside spaces with big cantilevers. And here you can have a barbecue, and uh, you can look uh, towards the other tower, but you can also look towards your own tower, and you can invite your neighbors. And that's really important that you create a community here in this kind of uh, building. And then we're trying to do this for the middle classes in Rotterdam. We're trying to do this in a totally different scale, but still smaller than uh, the context in uh, Shenzhen or in Taipei. Uh, we also are trying to do this. Uh, this one actually has 111 boxes from very small to getting bigger and towards the, uh, the sky. So uh, even here, it needs to have an energy efficient facade. It needs to save water. It needs to be a smart building. But most of all, it needs to be a good building uh, and a building with lots of attractive spaces where another community can emerge. And maybe uh, this building you can actually leave. If you live there, you can go outside. You don't have to take the elevator always onto the street level, but this is basically a piece of a vertical uh, uh, city. So it's a 24 seven uh, building and uh, it mixes all kinds of uh, typologies. It's almost like a city block that you just uh, flip up and uh, then you have a, a vertical piece of city. 
Then, of course, the big question whether we can do things like this also in a German province town, for example, the northern town of Kiel, not very big. And they invited us for a competition and we wanted to create this uh, uh, European skyscraper, but we had a bit of doubt. We, we might be way too uh, daring for Kiel. So we decided in the competition phase to not just send them our radical design, but we sent them a scale. So we sent them the typical German uh, skyscraper, which is very normal and very boring. Then we have a, uh, perhaps a little bit more of a remarkable building. And then on the other side, we have the iconic and very radical uh, tower. And uh, we use the German word for Rücken or für Rücken, which, uh, uh, which also translates into crazy. So you go from normal to crazy in this uh, tower. And then uh, you can also do this with the facade. We made them a nautical facade uh, based on uh, local businesses. And you can have 25% uh, of uh, special facade panels, 50%, 75 and then in the end, you have cool Kiel, if you have the most radical tower. To our great shock, the city and the citizens actually wanted to have the most radical uh, uh, tower. We thought they might do a public participation process, but all of them saw the normal tower, they didn't like it, and then they went for the most radical option, and this is the option that we're now going to build. So sometimes it's also very good to just show the alternative and, uh, uh, and what you can have, and suddenly, people get, uh, get the hots for something that is more daring, even in Germany. Still, the architect is the God who decides how people will live. Why don't we let the people decide for themselves? Because we want to create uh, dream houses. We want to create this suburban lifestyle. So here we did again at the Y factory, we, merged, uh, we matched uh, 17 architects, the students with 17 clients, very different people the guy from the big Lebowski or the uh, a desperate housewife is in there, Marilyn Manson, a guy who likes roller coasters. So for all these people, we made uh, dream houses, uh, the ideal house, and then we put them into a software that would, put, uh, would mitigate between these individual dreams and put them into a very uh, rational slab uh, without losing too much of the qualities of these people. And then in the end, we go from an egoistical slab to a um, more collaborative uh, slab. And this is actually not as far away as you might think. If you look at the IKEA kitchen planner that you can already design your own kitchen, uh, this, is the this is the first step and this is the end where you can basically uh, create your dream house. And as you can see, uh, you can even have a, a, a climbing wall or a roller coaster in this apartment. We then were able to build one at the Dutch Design Week uh, for only one week, the students occupied it and they loved it a lot, had lots of visitors uh, who discussed the individual housing in a collective uh, building. And uh, this is really making uh, individualist dreams come true. But of course, also the city needs to be nice. Uh, today, in many places, uh, we give a lot of space to the car. We should have cities for humans, not for cars. Here you see one of these cities, uh, um, an inner city motorway in Seoul. Uh, Korea, we were asked to turn it into a, um, into a park. Because it's linear, we decided to make it, turn it into a dictionary from A to Z in the Korean alphabet. You can walk through the plant world. Uh, we designed lots of uh, pot-shaped uh, um, uh, yeah, like uh, activators, kiosks, libraries, but also lots and lots of flower pots. Flower pots because the bridge wasn't so strong, like the High Line in New York. So we couldn't use earth just like that. We had to work with the flower pots but we built it very fast and now we have this linear park where, which also uh, works like a botanical garden. And here you see how it works. You can look down onto the traffic, you can sit on the flower pots, you can enjoy the green, and it's actually quite green uh, for uh, the concrete environment of Seoul. Uh, you have to take selfies, very important in, in Asia. And uh, very astonishingly is that case, uh, KPMG actually um, found out that the initial investment of 30 million euro by the, the city was turned into a raised property value of a few buildings around who could have basically paid for the entire park if people would have known this. So this is super interesting and important. If you have less cars, you have more property value and you have more people walking there. It's now 1 million people every month that walk there. So you see it's, uh, it's a really good thing. Uh, in my city, The Hague, actually, this is near my home. Uh, it used to look like this, a bit like Amsterdam, very idyllic. 
but in the 1970s, the city wanted to become modern, so they got rid of all the old stuff and replaced it with uh, motorways. And now today, with a neighborhood organization, we're actually trying to, uh, to get rid of the cars and to bring the water back. And uh, so far, it looks very good. The city council has uh, unanimously, in an almost North Korean style of vote, uh, decided that they would, um, that they would uh, look into bringing it back. And uh, this, this will not just be nice for the people, it will not just be nice for sustainability, it will also be very good for the, uh, for the business. And that, that is always very important that you have a holistic uh, approach to this. We already saw this in Madrid, that uh, uh, if you have less cars, you have more turnover in the shops. So that's very possible. And recently, uh, because of Corona, uh, the, um, the businesses in the, in the street in Rotterdam next to our office have basically asked us to get rid of the cars as long as the corona rules uh, apply because the businesses are quite small and they wanted to extend into the street but then there were parking spots and there were cars and so what we did we gave everybody a terrace so they can also have uh, hairdressers outside and uh, the street is now only for pedestrians and this is really also super cool that uh, the businesses actually ask for this because normally a business would say I need a parking spot for my clients in front of the uh, in front of the business, but here they actually say get rid of all the cars and make uh, our shops bigger, give us more space so that we can actually host uh, these people in a one and a half meter uh, safe distance. So you see that even a dense city like Rotterdam can be safe for Corona if we get rid of the cars because the car has so much space in our cities. We also learned this, for example, in, in Norway and in Oslo. We built the biggest uh, uh, master plan ever for, uh, for Norway, or we planned it. We only did one of the buildings. And this, in China, this is only one building, but in Oslo, they were really scared of traffic jams and that the city would become unlivable. And there was a super um, simple solution, basically. Just don't put any parking spots into this master plan. It was located next to uh, Central Station. So you basically don't need the car there. So uh, what they did, they created 12,500 jobs, 450 apartments with only 20 parking spots, which means that you have uh, minus 6,250 car journeys a day, minus 110,000 kilometers of inner city traffic, and then all this uh, CO2 that you save. It's, it's really fantastic uh, what this uh, does. By simply having no parking spots, you really make the city a better place and the buildings are much cheaper. So it's always really good. And success uh, is also there in terms of economy. This is a MIPIM uh, uh, poster actually. Well, I'm gonna end with uh, urban planning. Also here we need to uh, work very differently uh, uh, when we make new neighborhoods. Uh, Jan Gehl is very right. The city needs to be for people. We would like to add for Jan, to Jan Gehl uh, that his um, philosophy is a lot about the, the ground floor of the city. We think that also uh, the city is a three-dimensional object. The life needs to also go up, not just stay on the ground floor. Uh, sadly, a lot of urban planning, uh, very recent urban planning in Europe is this kind of model where you see already uh, there is very little life, there's very little diversity. It's, uh, it's all made for the car um, and it's, it's made uh, according to very old principles and uh, it it's really doesn't create this kind of city that the millennials would like to have. Uh, they, they, they shop online, um, they don't go to the city to shop, so we also need less retail, but basically they want to have a nice time in a very good uh, urban environment. And here in Bordeaux we tried this uh, based on uh, two, uh, two former freight uh, um, um, stations and a uh, uh, barracks. We basically fill it all in. We, we bring it up 100 meter and then we cut it with a parametric uh, computer model so that you have light everywhere, but that you also have a very intimate city. So here you see these uh, very strange uh, shapes that uh, are created and they also create diversity because uh, whoever builds here cannot get rid of these shapes. They need to fill them. And that means that you have really uh, uh, quirky rooms and quirky apartments and therefore you have also a mix of people because you cannot have uh, 20 uh, identical apartments in these buildings. It's impossible. 
So you see that already by uh, with the urban plan, we we bring in a lot of space for um, uh, for solar cells. We bring in intimacy. We we get the car out. There is space for pedestrians. There is space for nature, and the buildings will be so diverse and done by all kinds of different architects. Uh, um, that uh, we have good hopes that there will be a real mix uh, use uh, neighborhood. Also, 42% of the 3,500 apartments is social housing. So uh, we believe that uh, this is a really good urban mix. And our example, how the urban planning should work is based on the old town in Bordeaux, but with more modern qualities, with more light, uh, with, more, um, um, with more green uh, areas, actually. So this is how we sold it to UNESCO. And they understood that it is very modern, but that it basically looks like a, a medieval city with lots of spires and roofs. So they loved it and they allowed it, even though it was visible from the UNESCO World Heritage site. And then we have, a, again, a botanical garden in the streets. And uh, now it's under construction. We will build for, more, for, for five years more. And you see the streets are very intimate. We even changed the French national law together with the mayor uh, that you can have six meter wide streets, which uh, was not allowed. And you see the spires on the roof here. So uh, it's actually quite quirky and uh, it's, a, it's a very new kind of uh, urban planning. And then from a distance, even though this building is more than 10 stories high, it looks a little bit like it fits into the urban surrounding. Uh, this is a, a working class neighborhood next to it. Uh, they wanted the buildings to look small. And from the other side of the river, also there, you see these very weird uh, shapes. Normally, uh, the other side of the river you don't go to, but we have good hope that people will see what's happening on the other side of the river and that they will get curious and that they then go into this neighborhood and that they find a lot, a lot of uh, small parks, small businesses, and a lot of life in a very intimate uh, neighborhood. Right, that's it. Super fast. I hope you could follow it all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. Uh, it was impressive to see uh, some of your projects and also your insights on this topic. Um, we all can see some of the some of the messages from the audience saying how nice it was um, to see the presentation. We uh, look forward to ask you some questions, but before that, we'd like to introduce uh, David. I know what he thinks about it. For that, um, yeah, David Schill, as David mentioned, our David mentioned before, uh, David Jackson. David Schill uh, is based in Stockholm, as from the company Ar Aritko. Um, he's global marketing director since uh, 2016, with responsibility for marketing and communication, as well as product and portfolio strat strategy. He was born in Stockholm um, and has expertise in marketing, brand development, uh, effect, affecting products and communication, uh, insight-driven innovation and strategy. So, okay, that sounds great. David, now you have to tell us what you think about this, about this interesting topic. And that, that was pretty straight on the uh, information about my history. Eh? Uh, thank you for letting me on uh, and thank you, John, for a, a, a wonderful presentation. Uh, I just need to start, I'm a fan of yours. So, uh, you know, this is really good stuff, I think that you are driving uh, and that your uh, corporation and company is actually pushing uh, in, in our society. Uh, but, uh, and therefore I would like to touch base on a, th a few things. Uh, I think we will uh, have a little bit of a struggle with at the same time, seeing all of this changes that are necessary uh, it, it, it's a big thing of what needs to come first, I think, in terms of we talk about this, uh, the, the, the buildings and we have new beautiful buildings, uh, but we still have the traffic. Uh, we have not changed the, 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 uh, the local traffic uh, in the same way, in the same uh, uh, pace as we're maybe then changing the buildings and, and uh, we're still needed uh, in a lot of, uh, of, of uh, uh, 
sustainable issues when we are building. So, so, so from your point of view, where do you see what needs to come first? Is it the buildings that will then push these changes or is it actually uh, uh, structural changes in the cities that need to come with, with traffic changes or what, what, what comes first? Sorry. Yes, we, we are on this, uh, on this issue since 1993 and we noticed that um, you always need somebody to actually uh, bring the change. So it's mostly what you need is people who want this and uh, there are, there's an increasing amount of people who want it, which is really good. So we can have more sustainable uh, cities, we can have more sustainable buildings, but uh, basically we are a bit like a beggar. We are happy with everything uh, that we can get our hands on, whether it's first the urban planning or first the, uh, the architecture, we don't care as long as it's, uh, there is this ambition to actually uh, uh, change it. So, yeah, and we have a massive uh, uh, job. Huh? I mean, all of Europe needs to yes. be uh, made uh, sustainable and uh, uh, low energy. Uh, so yeah. it, it, it is daunting. So. Yeah. But instead of just uh, thinking about uh, what to do first, I think we just have to tackle it everywhere at the same time and as good as we can, even if it's not perfect. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the major problem is maybe not the new buildings, uh, where we see, quite, uh, we see beautiful, attractive buildings. Uh, we also see uh, them probably, as you could share your evidence of them, uh, that they are somewhat affordable. But we also have a big, big, big problem, uh, social uh, polarization with, with ghettos uh, increasing in all the different cities. Uh, this is really a big uh, balance between the old ghetto buildings and the new wonderful vertical gardens and vertical vertical buildings, vertic vertical societies. Uh, I saw, saw your example of Gothenburg. Is that the answer of all, all, all the old buildings and ghettos to get everybody into an integrated society? I think uh, that's what we're trying to do. If you actually, uh, also our market hall in Rotterdam is 50% uh, uh, affordable housing, 50% it's uh, uh, commercial housing sold to the people and they live together in one building and you can't really see which is the, uh, the affordable or which is the expensive apartment uh, from the outside anyway. Um, I think uh, this, this kind of building actually mixes people and it would avoid uh, ghettos for the future. And that's super important. Um, uh, as you know, the uh, um, United Nations have said that uh, decent housing is uh, a human right mm -hmm. and we should provide this. And we made so many mistakes in the past, especially in Europe, where we had a very good system of uh, uh, building social housing and uh, somehow uh, it was sold out and uh, uh, a lot of these social housing corporations are gone. And we have to reinstate this and not leave it to the free market because the free market doesn't build enough. And uh, um, we, we have to provide housing for people so that they are happy and that they can uh, basically uh, build up their lives in, in, in comfort. Well, when you also grow the cities in this sense, as, we, uh, as you shared and discussed, uh, we need to have the walkable city and, uh, and get away with the cars. We are also, of course, uh, populating the cities with even more people than we have had before. Today, two thirds of the population, more or less, in all, all, all European countries are, are living in the cities already. That drives us also to very many different types of of public social services and, uh, 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 and governmental investments in different types of social programs, etc. Have you seen in your experience that that, that also is, is the actions coming from, from the government's municipalities or, or, or that they understand that because otherwise we will just implode again? Mm -hmm. Well, some cities, they, they have a very good uh, view on these uh, issues, but uh, the, the business model for the city is really uh, simple. If you provide a dense city, you don't need to buy so many roads. 
you can have uh, people actually walk to the library and you don't have a need to provide parking spaces for them and so on. So it's, um, uh, if you have more people living in one spot uh, close together, um, then you will have also the, the ability uh, that they can all walk to the services and you can actually afford more services. Uh, every supermarket, for example, needs, uh, I don't know, four or five, six thousand people uh, uh, to actually become uh, the client. So if you have them, uh, if you have lots of these people uh, together, you can have more uh, supermarkets. It's a very simple uh, calculation. However, if you, um, if you have a suburb that is uh, um, stretched out of a lot of land, then people would need to travel uh, to even get there because uh, they, they use up so much space. So yeah, we, we really need to uh, densify these, uh, these areas. There are way too many. We should basically stop uh, killing the countryside. Mm. Which leads me to uh, more or less the conclusion of my last, uh, last question. That means that uh, a production company like me, uh, like us, uh, we need to be extremely innovative and put our uh, focus on really insightful uh, understanding of the relevance of the future living uh, when we talk about our products like, like, uh, like lifts, etc., uh, and elevators. It's extremely important to understand the structure, but also understand how to use different types of products in a total new environment and, uh, and understanding from, uh, uh, for instance, Peter Becker of World Business Council for Sustainable Development, he says we have 10 years to go before we need to have the blueprint for the future, uh, which is quite interesting focus right now to then really majorly invest in innovation. Certainly, and for example, the, uh, you get more and more uh, credits for all kinds of things if you have a circular building. So mm. also that would be fantastic to actually have your products uh, uh, done in a circular way or with a plan to uh, become circular in a second uh, use perhaps, mm. Mm. so that you know if, you are, um, if your product uh, um, has an end of its lifespan that something will happen to it, which is uh, actually good. Mm. Mm. Gentlemen, um, if I could just shortly interrupt it's a really fascinating discussion um and myself Femin, and anais have just decided we'd like to actually leave not turn out into two breakout sessions rather than just stay in this group and continue this discussion but what we would love is also is if the any of the guests or the the audience who are here if they have any any questions to either Jan or to, or to, to David, um, or even if they have their opinions on urban densification, what are the, the challenges? Um, please do um, jump in. There's a little tip that I have. If you hold the space bar down, your microphone automatically turns on. So we're really looking forward to your insights also. Um, and to some further discussion with all of you. So please do jump in when you can. And perhaps to start the discussion, I'm going to ask Jan a question. Um, you mentioned in your um, presentation, in your keynote, uh, that there needs to be, or most one of the most important aspects uh, coming into the future is that there needs to be a building with a lot of attractive spaces. Um, what, in your opinion, is an attractive space? Wow, that's a very broad uh, thing. I mean, uh, it depends on your mood, right? What's an attractive space? You could sometimes like a, a quiet garden, sometimes a, a disco. Or So I think these, um, it's very important that these buildings actually provide uh, a variety of spaces. That, uh, that makes and sense. I, think, I think this is exactly the, the point that I'm trying to get at. I mean, we want a, a socially inclusive um, community, which means there are many different ways of, of living, different um, ideals, different, different needs. How does a, a city planner, how do architects um, come to the decision of how then that city should be, how the blueprint should look. Is it about talking 
getting in contact with all of the residents? Do, is that something you do on an everyday or on a basis when you're planning a new, a new blueprint? Do you talk with the residents? We try to do that indeed. And uh, for example, in India, we built uh, um, a flat with 3,200 uh, units. So an entire master plan just in one, uh, um, in one building. And what you do then is uh, instead of uh, just designing as an architect, you have to also think like an urban planner. Uh, what is needed? Where do you need uh, in this massive building? Where do you need a playground? Where would you need a, um, a place where the women could uh, meet? Where do you have a, a bar and a club and uh, uh, a place where, well, in India, it's very strict uh, uh, sometimes. So we had to learn all these things, um, actually. And they, they need clubs for billiard, uh, for pool uh, and, and snooker and stuff like that. So uh, that, that is really uh, important. And uh, on the other hand, you also need to be um, designing these spaces very flexible, that if, if they change over time, uh, that they actually do have a future and that they don't, uh, I mean, who knows about market hall, what that will be in the future. Will it always be a market or will it turn into a squash uh, uh, um, uh, <laughs> a, a place? Who knows? Uh, 